Okay, it looks like we have about six people here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you for being here today. Um, I don't think we'll take a really long time, but we do have some things we need to discuss and make sure you understand a project that's coming up and we'll go over a couple things from class. Um, but I'm glad you're here today and um, hope you get some good stuff out of class. We are recording this, so um, you might have noticed the recording thing was on. So I want to just get to it unless someone has any questions before we get started. Okay, well, if you have questions during, you can always uh, put those up in the chat or you can ask them out loud. Um, and I will try to get those answered. I'm gonna be sharing PowerPoint. You know, us teachers, we always have to have our PowerPoints up there. So I'm going to share the PowerPoint that we're gonna be using for today. Try to get that started. I'm going to go through that chat up there in case anybody wants to chat. So what I plan for today is to have um, just a tiny review of the NACI Code of Ethical Conduct. I know you've been doing the uh scenarios doing a great job with the scenarios they're really difficult they're challenging so don't feel bad if um you're not you know making 100 on all those typically students don't make 100 on on those they're really challenging they're difficult when we went to NACI conference we had a lot of instructors doing those um practicing on our um own and we struggled with them so they're challenging. And then I want to look at a project we have coming up called Becoming a Professional Project. It's worth a good percentage of your grade. So we wanna look at that, make sure you understand what you need to do for that. And then we're gonna look at child health and child obesity, part of one of your, your uh, units that's coming up. So those are the things we wanna look at. We only have 20 slides, so not a whole lot to go through. Um, today, but um, so it shouldn't be, you know, too awful bad. So just like I told you, this is um, our agenda and what we will look at today. The ethical code of conduct. I think by now all of us know that it is divided into these four sections and these are the responsibilities that we have as educators to these different groups, to children, to families, to colleagues, and to the community and society. So in each of your scenarios, you typically have to decide who you're responsible to. And that can be a challenge sometimes because, um, you know, I get the answers from NACI and what they say, and sometimes, I'm not sure um, what the answer should be. So it is challenging to um, decide sometimes, but you're doing, like I said, you're doing a really good job um, in making those selections. So our framework for trying to decide on these ethical issues is to look at these responsibilities that we have and brainstorm some resolutions and consider if there is an opportunity for ethical finesse. So I think, um, and actually this class, you are doing a really good job with this. I've had classes in the past who didn't do a good job with this, but you are doing a really good job with this. Um, take into account the parent 
point of view, the family point of view. Um, sometimes the, some students I have, they are only looking at the teacher point of view. And you are doing a really good job of looking at the parent point of view, um, even though it's difficult to do that at times, but some of you have children. So it may be that, you know, if you have children or you have nieces and nephews, you can kind of see that side of, you know, what the parent might want to do. So if, you know, sometimes it's straight out, you have to do this. It's the law. Um, it's a rule at your school. You have to do this. You, you, you can't go any other way. But sometimes you can, you know, sit down and talk with the parent and decide. So you can write in your solution, there could be one or two different solutions to it. And that's okay in your um, ethical scenario to have more than one solution written down. Um, that's fine to do that because there could be um, a solution that's good for the parent and a solution that could be good for you as the teacher. But you've also done a good job at looking for guidance in the NACI code. Um, you know, I think some of you did struggle a little bit on the one about the colleague um, and some of you want to go directly to the director and just tell on the colleague. But remember in the code, it says, go directly to the person first and talk to the person directly. And which is difficult to do to talk to one of your colleagues and to say, hey, you know, you're saying something that you shouldn't be saying and to address that with the colleague. And then if that colleague continues to talk like that, then you would most likely go to the director. And then also, um, some of you were talking about the, oh, well, that's this week, so I better not talk about that. So I might give up some answers. So I'll just hold off on that one. But then you decide on a course of action. Um, and I think most of you are doing a pretty good job on that. Um, so all in all, people are getting really good grades on that, probably better than I've had any other class. So I commend you for that and doing a really good job. So <clears throat> let's take a poll. Let me see if I can get up here to my polls. Oh my. Just did this last time. I have, I know I'm logged in. I created a poll for you. I'm going to try one thing just because this really aggravates me. Because I created a poll, especially for you, just to get you um, involved and interacted in here. <clears throat> it's aggravating me because it won't come up. Sorry to take up the time to do this, but um, okay, I'm signed in. Try this one more time. Oh, I got to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Okay, well, we'll just use the chat box. Do, do most of you have access to the chat box? Okay, uh, I wanted to do the poll because I had multiple choice and it would be much easier. You don't have to type. 
I'm really so aggravated. All right, let me try one more thing. And then if it doesn't work, I'll just, um, we'll just do the chat. I had a multiple choice thing for you. I tell you, this technology is just staggering me. No, that doesn't work. Okay. I'll just have to Google it <clears throat> and see why my polls don't connect. with, it could be something in the settings. All right, well, I'm just taking up your time. So I'm going to get off of that and just go back to share my screen. I'm frustrated. Okay, so we're just going to do chat. This makes it more difficult because now you have to think of something where I had actually answers up there um, where you could do choose for multiple choice. So what is um, something important that you learned about the NACI code of ethics? Type something in the chat. And I know that's going to make it hard because I'm doing it. You're coming off the top of your head. Like, um, so if you can't think of anything, that's okay. But uh, is it important because it helps you? And you can use some of these things I'm talking about. Um, is it important because it helps you uh, solve problems? Um, is it important because it um, gives you a guide? <clears throat> um, is it, <clears throat> sorry, I'm popping. Um, is it important? Okay, that's good. Is it important because it cares about children and, you know, I, you know, is, is concerned about children? Okay. All right, got some good answers. Anything else? We've got, seems like some of the messages are coming directly to me instead of to everybody, but that might be the way it works when we're on this, but um, it says um, somebody wrote, it's not only responsibilities to children, but to communities, colleagues, and families. I learned more about my responsibilities as a teacher and the code gave me guidance to solve difficult is issues. Um, it's important because it helps educators with difficult um, issues and then I think the last one everyone can read that's coming to everyone. Um, those are those are good answers. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to question number two. What would you like to know more about the NACI Code of Ethics? 
All right, we got one more answer about what, what is important. That's good too. Make sure we're being fair. Okay, that's good. What would you like to know more about the code of ethics? It's kind of hard to think about too. Do you understand the difference between the ideals and the principles? I don't think I do yet <laughs> completely. Um, you know, that's, that's a little tricky, I think. Um, I think understanding every single thing that's in there is a little tricky, you know, trying to interpret everyone, every one of the ideals and principles trying to, you know, what do they all mean? If we had time to go through and look at every single one, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I say this a lot, if you, if we had a face-to-face -face class, we probably would take more time and do more scenarios in class and get a little more practice. Um, you know, we did a few practice ones in the first class. And of course I canceled the second class. Um, so we didn't do, um, you know, have much practice in there. But um, it's a, there's a lot in that code. I mean, there's a lot you can really get into that code. And you might remember when you took ECD 101, you were introduced to the code, but you might not remember that because um, it might've been a long time ago when you took ECD 101. You might've even gotten a small little pamphlet with it in it. What are you confused about? And I think I know what somebody might say. I have a feeling. Is anybody confused about the responsibility versus the dilemmas? You kind of got that figured out. What about just being confused as far as uh, scenarios in general? Like some of the parts of the scenario Like who are who are you responsible to, or uh, maybe which um, principle might apply here? When I first started doing the scenarios, I gave the students a blank worksheet, and I would say, "What's the problem?" Who are you responsible to, um, you know, pick out the principle or ideals that match here and then tell me the solution. So I didn't have it in a format like we have it now where there's multiple choice. And they really struggled that way. So I changed it to the way that we do it now. 
<clears throat> and so I think y'all are lucky that <laughs> um, at least you have some choices um, where they had to go and search all the way through the code and find the one that would match. And that did not turn out well. That was really difficult um, for them to do that. Um, okay, let's see, somebody's got something up here. Yeah, it is confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think if we had, if we were talking through the scenario, that might help a little bit and give us um, more information. And then I think it would make it easier to actually do the, um, the scenario too. So as a teacher, how is this code of ethics going to help you? What is it going to do for you? Even if the, your school doesn't use it, you still have it. You know what it is. You've had some practice with it. You could always refer back to it and, you know, how could it help you? Right, good, Latoya. Yeah, I think it definitely will help you in that way. Because it's confusing sometimes when you have to make a decision. Um, even teachers who've been teaching for a long time, I think, struggle with making right decisions sometimes. Mm hmm yeah, what to do for a situation, better decision making, good choices, good. Everybody has some good answers. Thank you for the answers. Okay, great. All right, so thanks for the, the putting all that in the chat. I appreciate it. And um, that was kind of our review, just looking at that um, and giving you some ideas <clears throat> about that. And it helped me a little bit to kind of see where you were with the code of ethics and all that. It just gave me uh, some information too. So um, thank you for participate, participating. So let's look at your project that is due November 21st, which seems like, oh, wow, that's like a whole month from now, but that it'll come up fast, believe me. So you want to be ready for this project that's coming up. Um, you know, sometimes it's good to go ahead and get, you know, the project started in a Word document and start putting some stuff in there. Um, you know, I always have these plans of working ahead, but, you know, it never works out that way. <laughs> but it's good to um, think about it and try to try to get ahead if you can. Basically, you're going to write a paper on becoming a professional, becoming a professional teacher. The tricky thing about this paper is it's 20% of your grade, of your final grade. So that's quite a bit. So you want to make a good grade on this, obviously. In this paper, there's uh, sort of three parts to it. So you're going to describe um, the importance of joining a professional organization. We um, have a discussion question on that. So I suggest that you look at that discussion question, use some of your ideas that you had, use some ideas that other people had, um, and put that in your paper. That's the reason I did the discussion question is to help you out with, the, with this paper. So, um, you know, those answers that other people gave should help you 
and your answer should help you. And then explain your philosophy of teaching. And I know you've done this in lots of other classes, but this one is going to be a, a little bit different. And then you're going to talk about after you finish your degree here, what are, how are you going to continue to learn? What's your professional development plan? I know that teachers have to get so many hours um, after you, you know, when you become a teacher, you're going to have to continue to get, you know, hours. How are you going to do that? What are you going to, what are you going to do? So you're going to have to talk about your plan for, to continue to learn. So part one is the importance of joining a professional organization. So you're going to write, you know, probably a paragraph, maybe two. So talk about the benefits, you know, what do you get when you join a early childhood, like association like NACI or, or something like that? What are all the good benefits to it? And then talk about the reasons, you know, why would you even want to join? Why would you want to stay a member? And then you have to talk about, you know, being um, collaborative with other people, um, continuing to learn, you know, as part of a member in this group, thinking about working with, with other people, going to conferences and things like that. Um, you know, learning from other people. And then think you also have to talk about advocacy. So, and the reason this is in this section is because most of these organizations are there to advocate for children and families. So, if anything gets left out of this paper, it's typically the advocacy part. So don't lose points on this. But you want to talk about how you plan to advocate for children and families. So think about, you know, we talked a little bit about advocacy. Um, there'll be more as you go along. We'll talk about advocacy, but talk about um, your responsibility, at least, um, uh, to advocate for children and for families. So just make sure that um, you show that you understand that you have a responsibility, that you should advocate for children and for, for families. Even if you don't know exactly what areas you want to advocate for, um, just show, you know, just tell that, you know, you have a responsibility to advocate for children and families. <clears throat> and then part two, you're going to talk a little bit about your philosophy. So you want to think about some kind of research-based knowledge. So we didn't talk a lot about that in this class, but you may have taken another class such as like 237 methods of materials or maybe growth and development or something like that where you talked about some theorist or some curriculum models or something like that. You know, you might wanna add in um, you know, something to do with a curriculum model, something to do with a theorist or something like that. You know, what do you follow? What, you know, do you like a certain curriculum model? Do you like how a theorist, you know, you like children learn through their senses like Piaget talked about, those kind of things. Um, you know, just say a little bit about that. And then, um, your philosophy should also talk about um, the reflection of your values um, in teaching. So just talk a little bit about what do you value? You know, maybe you value hands-on learning. That's important to you. Maybe you value um, parents being involved in the classroom. 
um, you know, just think about something that's really important that you think should be in your classroom. And then tell how you will um, influence the children in your classroom. What are you going to do to have a positive influence on the children in your classroom? Just say, I'm going to positively influence children by being a really caring teacher who is involved in their lives by such and such. You know, I'm going to say positive statements. I'm going to be very encouraging. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't know. There's lots of different ways you can do those things. I'm going to work on their self-esteem. I'm going to, you know, I don't know. You, you can make whatever you think you're going to do. And then you're going to go back to that code and you're going to say, I'm going, I know that I have responsibility to children and say a little bit about what's in the code. I have responsibilities to children because I know that I am not to harm children, that I'm not to, that I'm to take care of them. I know I have responsibility to families, that they should be included in the classroom, that I should respect their cultures. I know I'm responsibility, I have responsibility to colleagues that I should work with them collaboratively, I should blah, 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 whatever, I have responsibility to the community that, so you just have to say a couple sentences about those things. So as you're listening to me, you're probably thinking, this is a lot of stuff to write. It is, it's, this is gonna be a pretty long paper. It's probably, it's gonna be at least three pages, through at least three full pages. And then the last part, Tell how you're going to continue to learn and how you're going to improve your teaching. So, you know, you might go to webinars, you might go to conferences, you might go to classes, you might go on to get your bachelor's degree, um, you might learn from teachers that you, um, you know, are more experienced than you. Um, you might go to different training classes. You might read um, books. You might read journal articles, you know, all those different things. And then include specific learning opportunities. And that's kind of the same thing, I guess. Um, just make sure you're specific about, you know, what you're going to, what are those things that you're going to do. So it's those kind of two things kind of go together. Um, and then... How is this going to influence the work you do with young children? So you're going to do all this taking classes and all this kind of stuff, but how does that make your teaching any better? How is that going to help you um, work better with young children? What, it, you know, so what? You're going to read this article or so what? You're going to take this class. How does that make you? a better teacher and better to work with young children. Well, it's going to help me learn new teaching strategies. It's going to help me to know how to work with children whose families are, you know, going through a divorce or, you know, struggling with stress or whatever, you know, just, you know, say some things like that. So basically, um, you just you just want to show that you know that you're not doing this professional development for nothing. You're doing it because it, it relates to your learning and it helps the children. You're not just doing it just to be doing it, that it means something. So any questions on the, uh, the professional development? are becoming a professional paper at the moment. It's a lot. That's why you might want to um, 
get started. And I see a question from uh, Carolyn. Um, you do not have to use uh, the citations. You can, but you don't. You're, you don't have to. You don't have to. Um, and then just kind of summarize it at the end, you know. Um, and then you know, obviously, try to use good grammar. Try to not have a lot of mistakes. If there's one or two mistakes, you're not going to get counted off. Um, and you know, it should be in a good format and typed up and all that kind of stuff. That's just what that means. But um, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with that. <clears throat> Okay. If you get started on it and you want me to look at it, you have a draft or something, I'll be glad to look at it and give you suggestions. Um, I don't mind doing that. <laughs> okay. Latoya was about to ask that. Yeah, sure. In anything, any any work that you ever have, I'll always do that. So let's look quickly at this before we go. Um, we just have a few slides about this, child health and childhood obesity. Um, and this definitely is an issue um, in the United States, serious problem. Um, and um, I even put some rates for um, South Carolina in here, which is um, really not good. And if you look at some of the literature that's out there, um, some of the factors behind poor diet, um, they talk about uh, some parental factors and they say that children learn by the parents modeling um, and they talk about um, if children can be exposed to healthy foods, they can overcome the dislike of those uh, food. Sometimes children, what they don't like green beans or they don't like, you know, peas or whatever. But they say if they, if you continue to expose children to those foods, eventually they will like some of those foods. They might not like every vegetable. My grandmother used to pay me a nickel to eat squash. <laughs> I never liked it. I still don't like it. But she would always pay me just to eat a bite. She'd pay me a bite to eat yellow squash. I couldn't stand that stuff. I uh, still don't like it, but, uh, you know, I do like a lot of vegetables, but I was exposed to vegetables. Um, but they say to also structure mealtime, and they say that families who eat together consume more healthy foods. And they say that eating out or watching TV while eating is associated with a higher intake of fat. Um, and um, allowing the child to choose um, is associated with um, more positive um, outcomes of having healthy choices. They say that, you know, if you give them some choices of some healthy foods that that can help a little bit, you know, saying, you know, would you rather have corn or green beans? At least, you know, both of those might be healthy choices, but they're still getting a choice instead, instead of saying, you know, well, we're having chicken fingers and French fries and we're having this every day. <laughs> you know, you're never really getting any, you know, green vegetables or anything. Um, let's see what else they have on here. Um, it also says that 
the fast food consumption has increased over the years. I think we all kind of know that. And with parents working outside the home, um, it's kind of just been that convenience thing. And I remember, you know, um, when my kids were young and at home, it was easier just to run and get a pizza or something like that a lot of nights. It's just, it's hard. It's really hard to cook. Um, I cook a lot now because I don't have children at home. So it's easy for me because I don't have anybody whining or crying or whatever else. And it's, it's, it's really easy, but um, you know, it, it's difficult. And then the sugary foods, there's a lot of sugary foods, especially soda, but you know, you can't just blame it on soda. There's also juice. Um, even 100% fruit juice has a lot of sugar in it. And then sports drinks, same thing, lots of sugar in it. People think, well, sports drinks are really good for you. Well, they're filled with lots of sugar. So we have to be careful. And then when I was a child, there were, we didn't do a lot of snacking and stuff. But now there's snacks galore. I mean, everybody's having snacks of, you know, all types. So there's a lot of snacking going on and the portion size have definitely increased. I think, um, you know, you know, you go to restaurants now and you can almost share a meal with somebody because the portion sizes are so big. So, um, you know, it's a lot. And then <clears throat> children spend a lot more time watching TV or playing video games, um, being on the computer, that kind of thing. So they're not getting the exercise that they used to be used to do. Um, when we were young, my mother, most times she didn't let us in the house. We had to stay outside. So it was sort of like we were running around outside all the time. You know, people would probably think that was cruel now. But, um, you know, we walked to school. Um, but now I don't know if it's even safe for children to walk to school, but we always walked to school or rode our bike or something like that. But now it's kind of, not really safe to do things like that. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, things are just different, you know? So um, it's, it's just hard. So we know that um, through some of the research that childhood obesity can affect um, not only children's physical health, but their social and emotional well-being and their self-esteem, which if their self-esteem is affected, then they it can be associated also with poor academic performance and a uh, um, lower quality of life. So, um, you know, there are numerous health conditions, you know, even sleep apnea and diabetes and asthma and liver disease and uh, heart disease and skin conditions and, you know, and it could follow them into adulthood. So there's so many different things. Um, unfortunately, these children have a tendency to be bullied. Um, it's not right. Um, and it, it's just, it, there's just so many things that can happen. So it, we have to be careful um, especially as teachers, not to allow that to happen in our classrooms. Um, but here are some of the complications I was talking about. When you look at these, you just think, oh my goodness, that's a lot of issues that can happen for a child. And like I was talking about, here are some of the main causes of childhood obesity. You know, when there's genetics involved, that's difficult because there's not a lot you can do about that. Um, it's rough. It's really rough. Now, for us as teachers, um, there are some things that we can do. We can educate families and we can help in the classroom too. So we can definitely, uh, you know, if they, if a 
children bring their own lunch. We can't do a lot about that. Um, but we can definitely have good um, meals if we provide the meals at school. Um, and we can provide lots of active time for children. And, you know, for some schools, they do not allow any TV watching, such as the Child Development Center here we have on campus. So we can definitely do that. Um, you know, make sure the portions of food is are appropriate and, um, you know, teach children about nutrition. We can do lots of um, lesson plans around nutrition and we can send reminders home to families. Um, you know, you think families know about some of these things, but they don't always realize um, these things. So we don't want to send home loads of things, you know, maybe just a tip each week or something, a quick tip or something like that, so that um, families can um, learn, you know, quick tips or something like that about staying active or a quick tip about food or, or something, um, or a tip about sleep or something that would be helpful to them so that we can educate them and help the children. Okay, um, that is it for, um, for our slides. I'm gonna stop sharing and we are finished for class.